of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's play, The Secret Road, the story of the Culpers of Long Island, the six spies who changed the course of American history. Our star, Lee Bowman. <laughs> Late in the War of the Revolution, New York City is in the hands of the British, but the French fleet, bearing a well-equipped army, has sailed for Newport in Rhode Island. With the French fleet rides General Washington's last meager hope of victory. A storm is raging in New York Harbor. a hurricane peak of howling wind. We, who were trapped in the British prison ships out beyond Governor's Island, rolled and wallowed in the filth around us, while the gale drove in from the southwest and yanked and tugged at the hawsers along prison road with a mad giant's muscle. At dawn on the third day, I was sent stumbling up to the deck with a pail of slops to empty oversight. I did what I had to do, well to the Lord. And then I saw the hawser that made us fast to the next ship in line. I saw it sway and tremble. And then the great rope broke. With well, a sound, believe me, just as the books describe it. Like a rifle shot. How I, how I made it to the shore, I'll never know. But when I could think again... I was lying with my face in mud on a partly cobbled beach, a landing place of some sort. I <coughs> I gasped the mud out of my nostrils and looked around. I was ashore on Manhattan. Then I heard a patrol, a British patrol. I pushed myself back through the mud out into the icy harbor water. Wait. my head upon the filthy tide. Then I gathered myself together and ran. Ran for dear life. At the first corner I stopped. Dodged into a doorway. In here. What? In here, you fool. Come in. A British uniform. No. Come back. I'm a friend. I... I stand in need, friend. Believe me, I am a friend. In. In at once. Ah, there. Now we must move quickly. Back here, into the kitchen. Now, before you drip mud all over the floor, get into this closet. Get in, man. In the name of the king. The door is open. What do you want? Blimey. An officer. I am an officer of the king, yes. Now, what do you want? Be quick about it, my good man. We are searching for fugitives, sir. Off the prison ships, what broke up in the storm. We thought we saw one of them running here. I heard footsteps outside this door not three minutes ago. I looked out, and I saw a figure running disappear around the corner down toward the docks. You'd better be after him, Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir. We'll get him, sir. We'll get him. Good man. Oh, I hope I've been right in this. You there in the kitchen closet. They're gone. Come in here now. And keep your hands up. You, uh, you said you were my friend? I hope I am. I hope so. A pistol pointed at the guts of a friend. That strange friendship, friend. In my business, friend, I can take no chances. Now, who are you? Captain Grant Ledger, late of Bland's Continental Dragoons. Captured by the British, sir, in the Carolinas. 
imprisoned at his majesty's pleasure in his majesty's stinking prison hulks out yonder in the bay. The wind blew me in. Well, friend? Captain Ledyard, by all that's holy, man, man, roll up your sleeve, your right sleeve, roll it up. Very well. There you are. You are, Captain Ledyard, you actually are. Your arm was tattooed in that anchor design when? At New London, when I was young and foolish, and a sailor. <laughs> Most fortunate caprice, Captain. I've been set to look for you, sir. Why whom? By one of the great men of Earth. One who knew you at Valley Forge. General Washington? Yes. He said, look among the men in the prison ships. If you see a tall, straight cavalryman with an anchor engraved in blue on his wrist, get him free. Tell me it can use him. The great storm set me free. But who are you? And who is Talmadge? Well, to our, our mutual friend, I'm known as Culper Jr. To my lord general, Sir Henry Clinton, I'm known as Robert Townsend. The useful bootlicker and gossip. A merchant of sorts and an officer in the home guard. You're a spy, Mr. Culper? I am a spy, Captain. Who's that? Another of our company. Come in, Austin. Tony boy, I'm hungry and thirsty. Mostly I'm thirsty. What? Who's this drawn rat? This is Captain Ledyard. He doesn't know it yet, but he's made to tell me his new courier. Uh, Captain, this is Austin Rowe, who also rides for us. Howdy, courier. Oh, you been clamming, son? No, I've been for a swim. You couldn't have picked a better day for it. Mighty nice weather out in the bay. Sit down, Austin. No, sir. <laughs> I'm going to save my sitting for later. Now, look here, Tony. I've been riding since dawn yesterday with my stern sheets in a most shocking condition. The jug's in the cupboard, Austin. Dawn. <laughs> ah, she's full. I was expecting you, my friend. You know... I sell this stuff back home. I don't know why. <laughs> well, <laughs> bottoms up. Oh, take it easy now, Austin. Ah, sure, Tony, sure. <laughs> There's work to be done, says he. Said. There is. Yeah, there always is. <sighs> what is it this time? You will convey Captain Ledger here to his new post of duty with Major Talmadge in Connecticut. The Major has need of a new man. That's a pleasure, <laughs> He's looking at you, Captain. Listen to me, Austin. You too, Captain. Week in and week out, I send information out of New York by way of Long Island to General Washington up in Westchester. Usually it's almost meaningless. Routine. The weekly count of regiments to the line. Ships in the bay. Fortifications built or abandoned. But today... You got a big one, County? The biggest. So big I tremble. And so big it's best for you if you don't know what it is. Now... There'll be no written message this time. Good. Abe Woodhull had to swallow the last one. <laughs> Darn, you choked to death. Quiet, Austin. We have a new system. Look here, you see this pile of blank paper? Yeah, I'm a stationer, among other things, Captain Legend. Mm -hmm. So I see. Now, this stack of foolscap, now I count off the sheets from the top. One, two, three, four, five. I place the six sheets back on top of the pile. All you have to do is remember the number. Six. Six it is. One and a half dozen. Like the fried eggs. I can... When you have delivered this innocent choir of writing paper to my very good customer in Connecticut, you will tell him just one thing. The number. Six. You will start at once. But, Tony, I ain't up yet. You can eat at Underdunk's Tavern in Brooklyn. Your horses are there. And, um... I fear, Captain, you'll need to wait till, till then for a dry clothes. Well, I'm pretty well dried out now, thanks to your fire. And I'm used to worse than this on the prison ship. But... Yes, my friend? You have been my friend. But the uniform... Oh, yes. Well, I am one of the small, fortunate group, Captain. I'm an officer of the Torrey Home Guard, General Clinton's pet merchants. He tells us what to buy and sell at a delightful profit. Then, of course, we share the spoils with the general and his staff. And he trusts us. You see, we're thieves together. You're a brave man, my friend. Nonsense, I shake in my boots. 
But before many hours are out, you'll meet the bravest of the brave. Hmm? Who might that be? Cowper Sr. Well, then, the number is six. six. Good. Be off of you. The ferry to Brooklyn was closed when we reached the slip. By sudden order of General Clinton. By sudden ominous order. Something surely was afoot, something big. But a pass signed by Robert Townsend, our culper junior, opened the gates to us as if by magic. After a hearty meal at Onderdonk's Tavern... Ah, 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 that's more like it. Nothing like a good steak for breakfast, even if a man does have to eat it standing up. Uh, Mr. Rowe. Oh, they call me britches. Short mm-hmm. for leather britches. <laughs> well, britches, I'm in a daze. Things have been happening too suddenly. Well, in this business, Captain, sudden is the way things happen. Sudden or suddener? This, uh, this man Townsend, Culper Jr., Who is he? You heard him. He has a finagling, sticky finger in every army supply contract the Britishers gives out. He makes thousands every month. And every cent of it he uses to buy food for yarn poor devils in the prison ships. Unbeknownst to the redcoats, of course. Uh, I wondered where the fresh food came from. More than that. He's a reporter for the papers. (laughs) In a nice way, that is. It's strictly social. Uh. A journalist, too. Yep, he writes for Jim Rivington's high-toned Tory Gazette. The gossip, mostly. So every red-coat officer in town butters him up to get his name in the paper. Oh, he's a sly one, it's down. But uh, who is Major Talmadge? He's a talkit boy. He's the end of the road, or almost. His writers work out of Fairfield in Connecticut. They take the stuff to Washington. You'll be one of them. Uh-oh, here they come. Who, man? Who is it? Just our horses. The everlasting horses. Come on, let's get out of here. Man, I sure am sick to death of horse flesh. That's a mighty good-looking pair of mounts. That's all to be. Hey, and you know who owned them? Who? General George Washington himself. His own private personal property. And you know where they're stabled? By order of Robbie Townsend. Of course I don't. Where? In General Clinton's own private personal stable. That's where. How's that for pure all-fired Yankee <laughs> call, eh? Come along, man. We got 60 miles to ride. Cavalcade story, The Secret Road, starring Lee Bowman as Captain Ledger. Long Island was a strange place in the fifth year of revolution. One third patriot, one third Tory third neutral. We were stopped once by the British, but Townsend's pass saw us through. Now look, out here towards Suffolk, it ain't the British that'll bother us. There's night riders, bandits, what they play both sides against the middle. They kill a man to get his gold tooth to sell. Oh! Now oh. Well, let's walk him a bit, eh? You, uh, you have that choir of paper safe. Sure, sure, in my saddlebag. The number is six. Uh, six it is. What happens if we are stopped by those marauders? We ain't stopped, that's all. I see. We shoot our way through. You're learning, Captain. Better look to your pistols, priming and all. I have. I'll tell you what. I can pick them beggars out by the cut of their jib, see? Most of them spends their loot in my tavern and see talking. Man, I can smell them every time. If we're stopped again and it's British, I won't say a word. Just you pull out that pass for him and talk pretty again. But if it's my thieving friends, I'll yell out, up the culprits. Up the culprits, and we start shooting? Without any waiting, sir. Hey, listen. What? It's them. That's Jeb Baylor's gray stallion. It's Black Jeb. Right, 
go? Oh, sure. Sure, I'm all right. Now, let's take it easy. This is Oyster Bay here. It's a remount station. Special for coppers. Remount? Yep. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Horses are supposed to get tired out, but not us. No, not tonight. Not, not oh. what's written on that seventh sheet of paper. Well, it's probably a recipe for chocolate pudding. Hey, Captain. Yes. Hey, uh, look. I don't see so good anymore. I'm getting old, I guess. <coughs> now, do you, uh, you see a big house on top of yonder hill against the sky? Yes. You know, that's Raynham Hall. Robbie Townsend's Paul lives there and his sister. British headquarters in these parts. How many lights is lit in the second story windows? Two lights. Good, good. She's near us then. Here we are, Miss Thompson, right here. Austin. How, how's my brother? Is he safe? Oh. Well, I... don't be scared, Miss. The captain here is one of us, a new one. My brother. He's safe and well. Now, we must oh. press on, Miss Thompson. The horses are at their usual place. Now, goodbye, then, Miss. Goodbye. Why? My love to Robbie. <laughs> Long boat in Concha. 
Agents Bay Number Three Cove. Uh, we? Well, yes. Maybe I ain't quite used up yet. Besides, friend, you might miss your way. Young fellas tend to get lost. How shall we be going? Huh? <laughs> tonight. And there you have it, gentlemen. We knew that General Rochambeau with our French allies had arrived off Newport in Rhode Island. Now we know that General Clinton has decided to send the entire British fleet, bearing half his military forces in New York, against the French Armada. If he seizes upon the French in the process of disembarking at Newport, then our cause is lost. Well, must be is there many nothing many we can do, General Washington? Very little. What I can do, I have already done. I have sent messengers out with instructions to let themselves be captured. Each one bears false dispatches in my handwriting. And the false dispatches say that the American army plans to attack New York in force in a matter of days. Given a miracle, that may urge General Clinton to turn back his ships to protect New York. Major Talmadge. Yes, sir. I cannot sit quietly here. Is there a place where we might observe the passage of the British fleet up the Sound? Yes, sir. Near my quarters, outside Fairfield in Connecticut and opposite Port Jefferson. I shall join you there with my staff at sunrise. <laughs> Headland near Fairfield in the gray light of dawn, and as the sun came up, so the sails of the British fleet swam into view, eastward bound against the French, a mighty naval force carrying a mighty army. If we hadn't known the purpose of that fleet, it would have been a beautiful sight. General Washington, sir. Yes, Major Talbot. The message from Culper Jr., well, he said that the Britishers had made plans to return to Whitestone if New York is threatened. Yes, I know. That is why I sent out the false riders to be caught. Their signal to turn about was to be a hilltop fire and a cannon shot on Eaton's Neck in Huntington or Crane's Neck in Pawkett. They're past Eaton's. All the ships are past. Major, on the headland opposite, on Crane's Neck, a fire! signal fire. It was so far away, too far to be sure. Then we heard, as if from a thousand miles away, the faint boom of a cannon shot. An answering puff of smoke went up from Clinton's flagship, standing out ahead of the fleet. And 
believe them. They're turning, sir. They're coming about. Look at the ships. They're turning. They're heading back for New York. Thank God and the cultists. The French are saved. And our course is saved. The two culpers and their assistants were sworn to secrecy so long as they should live. No member of the band ever broke that oath. It was not until a few years ago in 1939 that the scholarship of historians and the skill of handwriting experts unearthed the identity of those unsung heroes by deciphering the culper code. Let them have now the laurels they so richly deserve. Abraham Woodhull, the organizer and leader, Robert Townsend, the source of information, Austin Rowe, the writer, Anna Strong, whose clothesline carried signals, Caleb Brewster, master of the longboat ferry over the sound, and Benjamin Talmadge, the last link in the chain to General Washington. to Lee Bowman and the Cavalcade players for tonight's true story. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by George H. Faulkner and was based on material from the book The Secret Road by Bruce Lancaster and published by Little Brown and Company and the Atlantic Monthly Press. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Boris. The program was directed by John Zoller. With our star Lee Bowman, you heard John Griggs' as role and Tom Collins' as Townsend. Others were Arnold Moss, Carl Weber, Scott Tennyson, Lily Lodge, and Robert Dryden. And this is Cy Harris, reminding you to be with us next week when the DuPont Cavalcade will present The River Finds a Master. Our star, Robert Young. DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you from the Velasco Theater in New York City and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry.